thanks so much to the organizers of CanMed and Cordigen and Doug Kennedy for getting everything so beautifully organized. So I have made two promises. One, I will speak very quickly and stay within our allotted time because we are running over. And two, I will make sure that you have an excellent experience. So I don't have to tell this audience after several days of this fantastic conference that marijuana has been around seemingly forever. If you look at newly discovered photographic evidence, you will see very closely that it actually wasn't a fig leaf covering Adam and Eve's most private parts. That's right. That's right. We have it. We are Harvard Medical School. We know how to do it. If you look very closely at the inside of the pyramids and, of course, evidence from the Sistine Chapel, you will see that images related to cannabis have been around for thousands of years. I'm only kidding, of course, but this is just a way to transition into the idea that, in fact, cannabis has been around for thousands of years, first documented as medicine in 2700 BC. It was part of mainstream medicine in the US, part of the US pharmacopoeia in 1850, which meant that doctors could and did prescribe cannabis for a range of indications. By 1942, it was out of the pharmacopoeia, and by 1970, it was classified as a Schedule I substance under the then new Controlled Substance Act. 1996 saw the first medical marijuana laws in California, and since that time, watch my beautifully animated slide, we have seen lots of changes across the nation bringing us current to 2017. We now have 28 states plus DC with fully legalized medical marijuana laws. Another 17 with partial medical marijuana laws allowing the use of things that are non-intoxicating like cannabidiol. Eight states plus DC have allowed recreational cannabis, leaving only five states without access. That's the majority of states. Very, very important to keep in mind, not all marijuana is the same. We have this one term, it really should be termed cannabis, but we call it marijuana, which means anything that comes from the plant. We won't go through the difference in species since most of us already agree at this point. Everything we see is predominantly a hybrid of species. More importantly, there are over 400 known constituents in this magical plant, 100 or more phytocannabinoids. These are things that interact with our endocannabinoid system. And thankfully, for all my predecessors at this conference, I don't have to go through it. But these are things that interact with our brain and body system of chemicals and receptors. The two main players, no secret here, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the main psychoactive constituent in the plant, and cannabidiol, the non-intoxicating constituent shown to have tremendous therapeutic potential. The last thing I'll say before we get into some exciting data is that medical and recreational marijuana should not be considered the same. I can't say that enough. They should not be considered the same. Even though the products may be identical, the plants from which they're derived are identical, um, in fact, the modes of use may be identical. The goal of use is very different for our recreational users than for our medical patients. The goal of recreational users, I've been doing recreational research, sorry, recreational uh, research on recreational cannabis users for 20 plus years. Their goal is to feel altered, high, euphoric. Our medical patients say, I don't want to be high, most of them anyway. I just want to feel better. Constituent profile is also very different. Typically, recreational strains are prized for their THC potency. We are looking for high THC here. In fact, levels of cannabidiol have all but disappeared from recreational strains, a drop in about 46% uh, since 1995. Our medical patients may have products that are high in THC and or other CBD, but there are other constituents that factor into the equation prominently. Age of onset, another very critical piece of the puzzle. Typically, our recreational users begin using during adolescence or uh, early adulthood. Our medical marijuana patients, not exclusively, but by and large, begin after age 25. That excludes, of course, our pediatric samples. I won't go through what the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine reported since it's a 395-page paper back in January, but many took heart in the following. There is conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for what we call the big three, treatment of chronic pain, treatment of nausea and vomiting as a function of chemotherapy, and treatment of muscle, related, muscle spasticity related to MS. More recently, since the report was issued, uh, the senior author of the paper, Marie McCormick, uh, has noted that, in fact, it seems to be useful in reducing some forms of very severe child seizure disorders. To many of you in the audience, I know that is not a surprise, uh, but to many out there, it is, and it's good that we have it out there. In addition, there's moderate or limited evidence for a range of other conditions suggesting that additional research is needed. I would say demanding that additional research is needed. So, 
While there have been a number of medical marijuana studies to date, research really does remain in its infancy for all the reasons you've heard here. Most of them have to do with our current status and some of the guidelines and restrictions. Most studies have looked at outcomes secondary to medical marijuana use for a specific symptom, illness, or indication, limited sample sizes. Um, in addition, when we began this work, we could not find any studies that looked at specifically the effects of the use of cannabis for medical purposes on cognitive performance. Was there a difference in individuals who are using medical marijuana in terms of their ability to solve problems and do tasks? Further, no studies thus far had employed a pre versus post treatment approach. Enter the MIND program, Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discoveries, a program I started at McLean Hospital two and a half years ago. Why? It was designed to basically understand the effects of medical marijuana use on a range of things, including cognitive performance, clinical state, quality of life, where applicable, brain structure, brain function, and a range of other measures. We just don't have this data available. The program supports a number of projects designed to examine cannabinoid-based therapies for a range of indications and conditions, and we use longitudinal, observational, cross-sectional survey and clinical trial models, but not all at the same time. That'd be a neat trick. So I'm going to show you some data from an ongoing longitudinal observational study that's very exciting. This study was specifically designed really truly, really truly to look at the effect of medical marijuana treatment on cognitive performance as well as mood, sleep, quality of life, brain structure and function in patients before they begin using. That's really important. This study is designed to follow patients over a minimum of one year. We've now gotten permission to follow them out for 18 months and 24 months. Patients can use for any number of indications and their choice of products, which we chart, what they're using, where they got it, what they're told is in it. So we have the information from the dispensary. We record it throughout the course of the study, how often, et cetera, mode of use. Then we have their most commonly used samples analyzed by an outside laboratory. Our laboratory representative is right here speaking in this very session. The potential participants are referred from local medical marijuana, marijuana certification centers or physicians, some of whom are also here. We're eternally grateful for all of you sending us patients. The inclusion exclusion criteria are simple. Pa patients must have a valid certification for medical marijuana use or plans to use products that don't require certification, for example, uh, industrial hemp derived products. Certification can be for any indication, but they must be marijuana naive at the outset of the study. This is important. And if they have any history of recreational marijuana use, it must be several years in the past. Until very recently, the average number of years since re heavy recreational use was in excess of seven or eight. Now we're down to about three. So they have to be THC negative at baseline. We wrote our first paper from this study at the end of last year called Splendor in the Grass. It's been viewed just under 35,000 times. Uh, to date, and uh, I guess this issue was nominated for the Frontier Spotlight Award. I only mention this because it underscores what the nation is interested in learning, which is about the effect of the use of cannabis. We need more research. So I have some updated data to show you. We now have 38 patients who have completed their baseline visit, and 19 thus far who have completed their visit too. So they're naive at baseline, then we see them after three months of treatment. Average age is about 50, predominantly right-handed. The indications range, pain, anxiety, PTSD, Sleep, mood, attention, and other. What's other? Ulcerative colitis, chronic migraines, petty mal, seizures. How are they using? They're using less than every day, and we've heard some of that earlier in this conference as well. They don't need to use every day. Uh, they use just le a little less than twice a day. They use about nine times a week, and they're using about 1.6 grams. What do they use? They smoke conventional flower product. They vaporize conventional flower product. They vaporize oils and concentrates, and you can see that, that, that there, there's other use of oils and concentrates, tinctures, medical edibles, and topicals, a lovely array of modes of use. Here's an example of our product analysis. So we get um, constituent analysis for 10 of the cannabinoids which helps us, but what about the data? I do not have a pointer, but I will guide your eye to the important part of the slide. Um, if you look, the very first thing that jumps out, I see the pointer, is um, a significant reduction in depressive symptoms. So this is self-report, this is not examiner-driven, this isn't the study doctor deciding that they look better, this is self-report. Uh, significant reduction in depressive symptoms. Uh, between baseline and after three months of treatment. We also see significant improvements in self-reported sleep, as noted by the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, way up at the, no, that's wrong, way up at the top. 
um, a significant improvement in sleep. We also see improvements on a generalized health survey called the SF36, significant improvements in physical role, significant improvements in energy, significant improvements in social functioning, and significant improvements in self-reported levels of pain. Let me say really quickly, we have a completely separate subset of pain-related scales too much for me to show in this particular presentation, but the patients all report significant improvement, self-reported improvement in pain-related measures after three months of treatment. Very importantly, we also see a notable decrease in their use of conventional medications, a 42% reduction in opiate use. This, again, self-report. 46% uh, reduction in benzos, 33% reduction in mood stabilizers, and a 22% reduction in antidepressants. I think this is quite striking. Again, very small sample sizes, but certainly enough of a signal for us to be very excited. So I won't belabor the point too much other than to say we were very interested in their cognitive performance. I spent a lot of time thinking about frontal executive functions, the types of tasks that are mediated by the frontal part of your brain, right behind your eyebrows, things that allow you to inhibit inappropriate responses, make good sound decisions, and um, detects conflict where appropriate. So we have lots of different measures of these things, including the controlled oral word association task, basically the FAS task. I'm going to give you a letter of the alphabet, name as many words as you can that begin with that letter. Digit symbol substitution test. Patients are basically asked to write as many symbols as they can using a number symbol key, as many as they can do in 90 seconds. Letter number sequencing. Subjects get a, a string of mixed numbers and letters, and they're told they have to repeat them, first the numbers in order, then the letters. The Stroop color word test, the interference condition, everybody loves this one. The interference condition basically has words printed in a different color ink than they spell. Your brain wants you to read it. That's the most automatic process you have. I want you to name the color of the ink, harder than it sounds. We also have the trail making test, parts A and B. Part A is simply a test of psychomotor speed. How quickly can you connect the dots? Part B introduces an alternating set demand. They have to alternate number, letter, number, letter. 1A, 2B, again, harder than it sounds. See, some people are saying, oh, oh, that looks horrible. Doesn't even make a nice picture. Let's start with that. Finally, the Wisconsin card sorting task, one of my favorites, considered for decades to be the gold standard measure of frontal executive function. Very simple. Subjects are given a deck of cards and four stimulus cards. They are asked to take one card at a time and place it in front of one of the four stimulus cards. What they don't know, after being told correct or incorrect, is that the sorting principles change. And they have to utilize the feedback from the examiner to change their behavior. That's the frontal function. So how do they do? Well. Again, significant improvement from baseline to three months. One day I'll get this right. If you look up here, we see significant improvements in the FAS task, significant improvements in letter number sequencing, significant improvements in digit symbol substitution. The Stroop color word test, significantly higher accuracy and significantly fewer errors of omission. We see a trend for faster response time during trails. Let me stop and say one quick thing, as if this wasn't quick enough. We have alternate forms of all of these tests, so we don't see any practice effect here. Okay? They have alternate forms of these measures at three months. This isn't a practice effect, plus it's been three months. Neuroimaging, I run something called the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Core, where I am fortunate enough to work around lots of lovely magnets retrofitted uh, in such a way that we can do structural, functioning, structural, functional, spectroscopic, and diffusion tensor imaging, all with what we call one-stop shopping. So we can take lots of different pieces of information and put them together later. I'm going to show you some data from an fMRI study that we did in all of the patients who were able to complete visit one and two. So once again, we have them complete a task while they're inside the scanner. This is called the multi-source interference task. Two conditions here. In the control task, subjects basically get three numbers. Two or zero, and one is a different number. They have to report the identity of the number with a button box. In the control task, it's easy. The number that's different is in its correct position as on the button box. Simple. Now we have the interference condition. This time, the two numbers that are the same are not zeros, and the number to be This is like a grown-up game of one of these things is not like the other, right? So which one of these things is not like the other, except now it's not in its correct position as on the button box. So they have to inhibit the overwhelming tendency of the visual position and instead report the identity. How do they do? Let's just go to the interference task right here in the middle. Significant improvements in percent accuracy. They go from 81.8 to 87.8. Significantly fewer errors of omission. Significantly faster response time. I won't bore you with the derived interference at the bottom, but suffice it to say, um, it's quite impressive after three months. Again, no practice effect expected. What about their brain imaging? What do they look like? So at baseline, 
this is at baseline, so no marijuana on board. We should see some activation, by the way. Typically, we see activation right here in the cingulate cortex during the completion of this task. And we see a little more activation, typically, in the frontal cortex. What happens after three months of treatment? So we see a, a very striking difference. You don't have to be a neuroscientist to see that these images are different, right? So a very different pattern of activation here in the cingulate and in the frontal cortex, significantly more, quote, voxels activated. If anyone wants a physics primer afterwards, come and see me. But to, su to summarize what this data shows us, we see generally demonstrated improvements in a number of these measures of executive function. This is important because a lot of our work and previous work uh, and work of my colleagues has demonstrated alterations in executive function in recreational users, demonstrating sort of impairment. Participants also exhibited notable increases in activation in the frontal cortex, including the cingulate, which is a region typically activated by healthy controls. This is our, folk, our group at baseline. This is our group after three months. This is a study I did in 2012 of healthy controls. Okay? This is our group after three months of treatment. This is a study of healthy controls. Okay? So three months of treatment. That's what we see. Overall, findings suggest that participants are able to quantify uh, and report their medical marijuana use throughout the study. We see improvements in cognitive performance that may occur with potential, quote, normalization of function. With regard to mood, sleep, quality of life, we do see some improvements. And very importantly, we see a significant reduction in self-reported use of conventional medications, specifically a 42% reduction in opiates. Given the current crisis, I think that's worth noting. Why are they improved? Symptom alleviation. I feel better so I can think more clearly. That's certainly a possibility. Product choice. We know that unlike recreational strains, many of our medical marijuana patients are choosing strains that are high in other constituents, including cannabidiol. In, in fact, a number of these folks are on high CBD-containing products. Certain cannabinoids may actually exert a direct or an indirect effect on cognitive performance. Age of the consumer. These folks, let's just say it, these folks are not necessarily within the window of neurodevelopmental vulnerability. They're not 20 or 22. The average age is 50, as opposed to our recreational sample significantly younger. All of this to be followed with further research. So just for my last minute, I will tell you what else we're up to. We have an FDA-approved clinical trial of a whole plant-derived botanical high in CBD sublingual tincture, approved by the FDA, approved by the IRB, unfortunately on hold uh, with the DEA. That's, for an, that's another talk. See the collective grounds? Oh, that's another talk. We also have, very exciting, uh, an observational study of veterans using medical marijuana products. We are basically looking at the impact of cannabinoids on clinical state and cognition, particularly those afflicted with PTSD, given the extraordinary need. We're looking at folks who are either marijuana naive, that is, they haven't begun yet, or folks who are on a standard regimen of cannabinoids or uh, cannabis products who are looking to add an additional product, and we'll follow them in much the same way as these other studies. So our next steps, we'll continue to examine the impact of medical marijuana on cognition, quality of life, and related variables. We're not stopping now. No way. Uh, we'll continue to do research that helps to inform empirically-based guidelines for use, including dosing, product selection, and age restrictions. Very exciting. We're exploring cannabinoid-based therapies specifically for veterans, specifically for women's health issues, and a range of other indications, hopefully using other products that are currently on the market. Additional clinical trial models are currently being developed to assess the impact of products which have shown efficacy anecdotally. At this point, I would say research is knowledge and knowledge is power, and I would implore all of you who are invested in this particular area, and you wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't, that this is the most important thing we can do, help those of us who are attempting to do research push the ball down the field, not to use a horrible thing from our, our, <laughs> our previous session, but really move the ball down the field. It is up to us as scientists and clinicians to inform our patients they're using. It's up to us to allow them to use safely and wisely and to educate them and to help them make good and sound decisions for themselves. Thank you.